is David. Um, I was born in the outer western suburbs of Sydney. Um, when, when I was about eight or nine, my, my parents split up, and um, in that process, I I moved around quite a bit with my with my mum, going to different places. And um, after after uh, I grew up and became a teenager, I was um, very interested in spiritual things from the age of about 13. And I guess my path kind of started there on, on the spiritual track. And um, also my relationships with other people we developed quite early as well. I guess I was kind of looking for something, but not really knowing what it was, and it was kind of like, um, <coughs> kind of like running without kind of seeing uh, things going on around you, it's like you're running, running after something, but what? You don't know, you don't really know, you don't really understand why either, and um, so after a while I kind of uh, when I was in a few relationships, I was kind of uh, seeking that kind of external happiness in another person to try and, try and uh, I guess, try to fulfill myself by finding that kind of happiness. But um, after a few times, I was quite, I was let down quite badly, which led to quite, um, quite a lot of suffering in my life because of that. And. I got to the stage where I just didn't want to go through that anymore and kind of led to a sense of um, I, I wouldn't, as we, in Buddhist term we say nibida, but I wouldn't, wouldn't use the word disgust, it was not a kind of sense but a kind of like a turning away instead I would use a turning away from that because I knew that I kind of felt that that wasn't going to lead me to a happiness because I experienced it and realized its results that it always ended in, in sadness and trying to find that kind of kind of happiness. So a lot of people think that oh, monks or oh, people want to become a monk or nun because they want to run away from, from relationships. So I guess in my case you could say that is true. <laughs> Um, with my spiritual with my spiritual journey, um, I, like I said, I was interested in spiritual things from about the age of thirteen, and um, I didn't really find something that fulfilled me in that area. And uh, I guess it was when I came across Buddhism that things made more sense. Uh, but before I became a Buddhist, I did a few different things. Um, I became, I was a vegetarian before I was a Buddhist and I believed in reincarnation before I was a Buddhist. So when I came to Buddhism it kind of made things a bit more clearer, it made more sense uh, how, how kind of rebirth to work is kind of um, it's a bit clearer. And um, I guess the thing that hit home for me was the Four Noble Truths because I had a, a lot of suffering and um, and I guess it just really touched something that inside me that was um, kind of uh, there's kind of some kind of hope that there there is that, that it's possible to to end that suffering. And uh, it's kind of like um, with my searching, it's kind of like um, a puzzle. You have a, all the puzzle except for one piece, and you've been looking for the piece. But you haven't found a piece, but then I guess when I discovered the Noble Truths, it was kind of like that piece went into place. And it's kind of like, ah, oh, that's what I've been looking for. And so from the age of 16, that's pretty much straight away I decided I wanted to take on monastic life, and so I started my search. Um, but um, backtracking a little bit, I, I did. Um, I did. Uh, Welsh singing for a while. I did music for a while. I did did recorder, and I also played the Celtic folk folk harp. 
and learnt, was learning Welsh as well. And so I used to do that every Friday. I used to go to Newcastle to, to learn. So it was about three hours of train going to Newcastle to, to learn. But um, I, I left that behind when I, I guess, when I went to, to ordain just before then. And before I ordained, I, I kind of became a bit more simple. I lost, kind of, was going in a different direction than my old circle of friends. And um, I became, I guess I was quite different to them then. And, and so I wasn't really interested in the way they were going. First of all, I was interested in, in Mahayana Buddhism and I want to, to ordain a Chinese tradition, but in my experience of trying to find a place to go, it was very difficult. I called a lot of places in Australia trying to find a place where they could speak English. I didn't hang up the phone when I spoke to them in English. And I didn't find a find place. Can um, do her introduction. I'm from Malaysia. I arrived at Santi four months ago. Joined the rain retreat for three months and continue to stay on. Introduction about myself. That is a bit funny <laughs> in front of the camera. <laughs> 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 Maybe just a little bit. Um, I'm 30, going to 32 years old. <coughs> and I joined the monastic community about two, two years ago. Before coming here, I was in Amarachi in England for for a year and a half. One year as Anagarika. After that I end my one year training as Anagarika and then I came back to Malaysia and I met my way to come to Santi because of the inspiration of Pante Suchato to re-establish the Bikuni order in the forest tradition. So being as buyer by his mission, I wish to be part of that, you know, and for the benefits of many others too. And life as a nun in this monastic form for myself is pretty natural which might seem strange for many others. But for myself, really, I feel this is just what I want to do in this life. And I feel so much joy, you know, living as a nun. And follow the teaching of the Buddha. <coughs> that you can really experience what 
the Buddha has taught to us and has been carried down generations by generations and until today we can really see for ourselves what the freedom, the release of the heart in the Buddha teaching. So yeah, that that's enough <laughs> for me. Mm. Maybe members of the floors, you have any question? You may ask. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask the first question. Um, were you like a Buddhist back home in Malaysia yeah. as well? Pardon? You're a Buddhist from Malaysia, like from birth. Uh, I'm from a traditional Chinese family, so they are not really practicing the Dharma, just yeah. kind of worshipping the Buddha. I, the time I really came across and start to practice is when I was at the age of 18 in my university. We have Buddhist society, so I joined the Buddhist society and joined many retreats with different teachers. From there, I start my path. So very little influence for my family actually, but now I'm in front of them, <laughs> <laughs> which is very good. <laughs> mm. So would that be more Mahayana oriented, uh, sort of Chinese, from traditional Chinese background? Probably you'd be more Mahayana than Theravada. Uh, yeah, the ritual you can say. You can different that from the form and ritual, but the essence is the same. The core teaching is the same. No. <laughs> she was very upset when I first uh, said to he said to her that but I slowly introduced her to Buddhism one year before I left my my home. So I get my family prepared on what I'm going to do. So they know that I'm a adult and I can responsible for myself. So slowly she has to let go because mm -hmm. I'm I'm really know what I'm going to do and what I want to do. Mm. So my parents give me that freedom. Mm. Was it difficult for you because your mom, how about your dad? I mean, like, because your parents quite, um, um, your mom's quite upset. So not quite a problem for myself because I have uh, six, si uh, no, five siblings. Uh, I'm the number three. Yes. So they still have another five. <laughs> 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 so it's not such a great last maybe for Renova Tapasi <laughs> because he is the youngest in the family. I have one brother and one sister and uh, my sister has five children and my brother has two so my mom has a lot of, a lot of people she can worry about. <laughs> so. Um, Did you have like yourself doubted sometime, like whether you want to actually go with this or? Yeah, of course you have doubts, but um, I guess we usually have doubts when we have a lack of contentment. Usually when um, 
something is not being fulfilled and when something's not being fulfilled then you look for other alternatives and that's when our mind starts to go out and then we have to if we have enough wisdom then we have to look at ourselves and see why why what is not being fulfilled and then try to address that because um, usually if you reflect then if you say well what am I going back to or you can also ask how far have I come and um, you know, do, you, do you want to pick up that which you've already put down how far you've already come it's like um, walking part of the journey and um, along your way, uh, before you started, you started out with a lot of suitcases and all the extra junk you didn't need, <laughs> as you do when you travel overseas. <laughs> and then on your long journey, you finally discover, why do I need a hairdryer in my journey? Or why do I need this or why do I need that? And you chuck it all out the window. Mm. But then, I guess, if you have that lack of contentment with what you have or what you what you're experiencing, then you start to try and go back and try and find those things, but actually they become a burden. So, um, but a lot of times um, the doubts can be strong, but um, you have to, I think we have to learn to be a friend of, for ourselves. And like when we develop metta, we develop metta for ourselves. So when we develop compassion, we should develop compassion for ourselves first. And the same with mudita or rejoicing or gratitude, if you gratitude in our own good qualities sometimes we're too hard on ourselves and um, think that oh I can't do this or um, or I'm not good enough that's the guilt coming in and um, but sometimes we're too hard on ourselves when actually we've come a long way Experience from for yourselves and amongst your companions. Um, are you aware that it's really hopeless if you haven't got? <laughs> I mean, is it worth even thinking about it if you haven't really developed um, great, wonderful things happening in your meditation? I guess, like I said, you have to look how far we've come. And maybe you've come a long way and you haven't realised it. And so maybe you, 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 that's a doubt. You think, oh, I haven't, my meditation is not so good, or so on and so forth. So it's kind of like a rotten, an apple rotting at the core. It's kind of um, instead of um, looking forward at what's possible, we look at what seems to be impossible and what is, what seems to be wrong now. But um, the inevitability of it all is that we do grow, and that. Um, depends if we want to grow or if we direct our mind in that direction so um, yes a bad meditation in uh, in the long run as a monastic if you have been a monastic for a long time and your monastic ha uh, and your meditation hasn't developed then this can can lead to a person disrobing because of that but but still it's, it's very sad because um, like I think we, we're just too hard on ourselves and that's why people end up leaving a monastic life or not having contentment because they're not, not happy with themselves but um, I guess when you in an idealistic sense when we come to a monastery we, we want our meditation to grow better and so when you're in an environment that is supportive then then those kinds of things grow. It's like if you're if you're with um, if you have a child and they and they're growing up around gangsters, then that their mind inclines in that way. So in the same way, wherever what kind of environment we're in, it kind of influences our mind, and that's why spiritual companionship is very important. So if you're in a in a in a monastery where there are a lot of people who have dedicated their lives to go in that direction then it's, it's much easier. And also if you have problems or uh, questions, then there are usually always people around you can ask without um, having long gaps. It's kind of like being stuck.
starvation. It's kind of like you have a kind of like a spiritual hit, but then you have a star. You, you kind of have a spiritual starvation where you have big gaps between the next kind of hit and that kind of thing. So, um, whereas it can be a bit more sustained, but the work also has to come. Work mostly comes internally. The people can only support us. People can only show us the way that we have to do it. So, um, I think. Um, don't worry about how our meditation is going. Um, just um, see what is possible. For, for myself, I see that you come in uh, into monastic life is a life of letting go. It's not about attending any kind of meditation state or to get something, you know? So it's actually you leave out the Dharma <coughs> and you try to leave out the Dharma if you are not. So in that monastic form, it will support you a kind of reminder, you know, to always come back to the center. What, what, what is the purpose of this holy life? It's all about abandonment and letting go. So the life as monk or nun is a life of simplicity. Lay life that you became disinterested in or disenchanted with, disaffected by. Same thing. Goes to school, uh, grows up, goes to university, has a relationship, gets married, spends most of their life earning a mortgage, uh, paying off a mortgage um, in a very stressful way, um, retiring, playing golf. <laughs> having grandchildren, <laughs> attending to grandchildren, and then dying. And it's like everyone does the same thing. And you're kind of like blind to that. Like, well, we're just kind of like lemmings going off a cliff, in a sense. But the thing that I felt I was turning away from was that the flow of the world was that in a materialistic sense, and that it's, it was flowing that direction, but that kind of... Um, Getting that plasma screen TV will make me happy, or going on my trip to Honolulu will make me happy, kind of thing. Just kind of didn't kind of um, wasn't. The, it's kind of like it was. Um, its flip side was seen, or um, I guess I just kind of had enough. Just kind of a bit. Um, it's kind of like if you. You drink the same tea all the time, you just get bored of it. It's just like it doesn't satisfy you anymore. It just doesn't provide what you thought it did or what it's meant or what people tell you for it's meant to. It's kind of like um you've seen you've seen the trick of it. You see the trick of it. It's the, the um like you're no longer kind of fooled about it's kind of become for me it kind of came from a sense of um, despair. It's kind of like I couldn't find that kind of happiness there because it just kind of fell out from, from under me and I had I had no control over my um, over that kind of seeking that kind of happiness. I had no control. It's like um, you're subject to something that was completely under control. And so um, yeah, I just just wanted to find. I, I guess uh, Buddhism provided that other way for me. So I guess before we before we ordained, we had the um, experience of you know uh, the two extremes. One extreme is where we've where we've had all the essential enjoyments, but then we kind of go to the other extreme of oh, what is all that about? That was all a load of rubbish or you kind of um, think, oh, that was a waste of time, 
or something, and then we go to the extreme. We can go to the extreme view of, of um, you know, uh, pessimistic view of of all of life. But over time, you kind of get a middle, get get closer to the middle way because um, you mature. I don't know if that answers your question. I was having quite an interesting teenage life, so. Um, kind of overfed myself, stuffed myself on too many lollies and felt sick. <laughs> <laughs> but with regards, um, I think we have, in a way we, it's kind of a, we have to use, in a way we're kind of using desire to abandon desire in the sense that um, when you want to become monk, obviously that's a want, that you want to be free from suffering, but it's kind of like a, you know, it talks about, um, uh, in the, in the sutta it talks about this kind of person who has this kind of uh, craving, oh, may I attain what, what the uh, noble people have attained, but once their mind comes down, then they're able to attain that. So it's not, so that, once they're able to let go of that kind of yearning, then that spiritual development can, can occur. But, um, I mean, um, you can get pretty dispassionate towards monastic life sometimes too, especially when we have, we, when we want to become a monk or nun, we have ideals, and obviously we want those ideals to be fulfilled, but when those ideals are not fulfilled, and we feel uh, let down, then that's it's very difficult, but that comes from ourselves, not from, from what other people are doing. Those kind of ideals have come from from ourselves, and we've projected them onto something, and then we suffer. Because, um, um, you know, we don't live in an ideal world. We, we, at the monastery, we don't, we don't have, we don't have, um, we can't, meditate every second of the day and there's mundane things that need to be done we may not want to do them and but they have to get done and so we end up doing them either we can bring a good sense of mind to it or we can bring a resentment to it and that oh why I, why am I doing this I have to become a monk I have to become a nun I don't want to be doing this why I this is not why I ordained it's like the story of um, Bajan Samedo in Thailand with Bajan Cha that he said they were doing this road work with all these big heavy rocks and they were working and working and working and then I just made a way to Ajahn Chah and said, I, why, I became a monk to meditate, why all this work? So then Ajahn Chah said in front of everyone, oh, Ajahn Sumedha, he, he became a monk, he, he wanted to meditate, so uh, he won't do any more work, we'll, we'll just carry on with the work. You, he can go off and meditate, you can go off and meditate, don't worry, you just go off and meditate. So, what did he do? He went up and meditate and thought, what am I doing? I couldn't handle it. It's too guilty, so of course he went out and felt. <laughs> do you have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning? I mean, is there some routine that you have that you're encouraged to get up very early? And if so, does it, does that, do you find that an easy practice or would you rather, wouldn't it be, wouldn't you get better meditation if you just lay in bed till you come? Why would you lay in bed? For me, I'm not a morning person. I find it difficult to get out of bed. <laughs> Sleep is a problem for me. But, um, um, I guess, I, I myself haven't been on any of Ajahn Brahm's retreats, but, but what I've heard is that he um, actually allows the people to have that kind of rest. It's not that kind of you. If you're being harsh on yourself, I must do this and so on and so forth. Well, you kind of um, might as well join the army because I mean you get more discipline there externally. The um, has to have a natural flow, but when when we do notice ourselves kind of slacking off a bit, then we need to bring ourselves into line. It's like um, 
kind of like a simile that um, when when you're herding cows and they're going off the track, then you need to give them a little whack to go back onto the track. But um, I've been on meditation retreats where you do have to get up at five, and I, and then you feel really awful and falling asleep, and, and you wonder what what's to be gained by it. You know? And yet it seems to be a common practice in in Asia in the Buddhist in the Buddhist time. So there must be must be seen to be a benefit, but I've not been able to find what the benefit is. So. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. Yeah, it's good to get things up early. Mm. <laughs> Do you get up at five? Depends. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> sometimes <laughs> three, sometimes six, <laughs> five. <laughs> because in San Santi, it's uh, up to you for the morning. As long as you turn up seven thirty for the work. <laughs> We don't have morning puja, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so it basically you have to be resp- responsible for yourself. But for myself, I like to do meditation in the morning. It really fresh you up mm. for the whole day, even though just ten or twenty minutes, you know. If not meditation, just some chanting, it will really change your whole feeling of a new day. <laughs> it will be a beautiful day. <laughs> Since our meditation is going very well in the evening, and so we have a very good meditation experience, or so we just want to keep on meditating and thus maybe meditate for three hours, four hours, and then, then. By the time we finish, though, it's already it's already twelve o'clock, and then we need to wake up at three o'clock, and so then you kind of get into this kind of uh, rigid, when you and when you become rigid, it's kind of like um, uh, kind of like a blunt saw when you're trying to cut wood. It's because it kind of feels that kind of bumpy kind of feeling as you're trying to cut. With your life, you just kind of feel kind of. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, sometimes we have a, a flow that suits us, but the amount of the environment that we're in, that, that kind of flow doesn't work because of our external situation, and so that can be a bummer sometimes. <laughs> but um, I guess um, always bring the, pro- the approach of being kind to ourselves first because we always need to be harsh on ourselves and if we, if we try and switch that and be kind to ourselves first then if we start to play up a bit then we can knock ourselves into line a bit but um, listen to ourselves is very important listening to what what does my body need or what do I need at this very moment? Do I uh, is, am I really tired and therefore I need to need some rest? And then you can investigate. Well, why am I tired? I've been thinking over a certain subject that's for a lot of strain. And then you can look at the cause and effect relation to to um, thinking about this subject equals tiredness and stress. Therefore, try to turn it around and have another way of seeing it. However, yeah. um, from what you described earlier, it sounded like you had a strong attachment to finding happiness through other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so did you struggle with, or do you still struggle with um, letting go of that attachment? And um, if, and what, um, did you look to any particular teachings of the Buddha that helped you let go of that attachment? Sometimes I, I did struggle with that. Um, the thing that kind of um, helped me to let go was this um, teaching of Ajahn Chah was um, not sure. 
just kind of, he used to say, not sure, not sure. So he said, um, if you think you're enlightened, not sure. If you think you're an arahant, that's even very much not sure. <laughs> it's very not sure. So, um, and the sense of impermanence. I, I read Four Noble Truths by, um, by uh, Ajahn Sumedho. And um, I guess that helped. I guess um, sometimes I look for the uh, emotional warmth, but my my journey is finding that internally, trying to develop that. So that's my that's my my path is trying to develop develop. Um, I guess my Quantas Jada said is um, that's kind of like developing yourself to realize that there wasn't one there to begin with. In your experience of uh, the years in monasteries, um, meeting with uh, people who have been monastics for 20 or 30 years, um, do you ever hear them, um, have you ever heard about their dispassion towards monastic life after that length of time and do you ever hear of people continuing in monastic life because they feel they have nothing to come back to in uh, lay life as, as far as because they never perhaps developed a, an occupation or something and so therefore they feel they must stay in monastic life? I guess in traditional Buddhist cultures, ordaining is an option for education. In some some places like Thailand, um, if you're or in Sri Lanka, if you're ordained, we can get free. I think we have three free university mm-hmm. in Sri Lanka, so ordaining is an option for education sometimes. But um, I've I've met one monk who who's had who had doubts, and he said he just keep putting them off. Um, I heard of one monk who after 20 years he disrobed, or two. Of two monks after 20 years they disrobed. Um, I guess it kind of eats you up from inside and you can't ignore it anymore if that is really the case. Or it's really the case that oh, you don't really have any other option therefore you stay ordained, it's not what you want to do. Mm-hmm. It's really your heart that's not there, and so it's kind of like rust. It kind of eats, eats it, eats away at the metal, and at the time the it's just a little push and this all crumbles. So um, you can't really hide it forever in monastic life because if you're if you're depressed or you don't want to be there or you're just hanging out, then people generally know what kind of direction you're going because they live with you and they see how you're doing whether you're practicing or not, or mm. whether you're doing whatever. But um, I think for Westerners, we're very, uh, kind of like, well, feel like a failure if I couldn't, couldn't do, if I couldn't do monastic life, and therefore want to leave. But probably in alien cultures, it would just be the norm. Mm. So but in Thailand, a lot of monks just were, um, have about 300,000 monks in Thailand. Um, they ordain temporarily. But um, in Sri Lanka, things are very different. Um, if you ordain, you ordain for life. And so if you disrobe, then you seem as very shameful. It's a very shameful thing. Um, but sometimes people have genuine reasons like, okay, well, if monastic life didn't work, then that's fine. That's okay. We can admit that and say, okay, well, it didn't work. And so now's the time to um, to leave, and that's okay. We're not going to hold it against someone if they want to just work. It's just it's unskillful. That's an answer question. Mm. Also, just as, um, as lay people generally, in order to survive, yeah. we tend to need somewhere to live and a certain amount of income. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe when monastics 
are older and decide to disrobe, they don't have any of those sort of foundations that lay people generally tend to have. What sort of, um, what do they have to fall back on then in that kind of situation? Usually falling into a relationship with someone else. <laughs> From what I've heard that I have people who disrobe feel that they have a lot to catch up on. feel that they can't go back to monastic life and so they feel kind of devastated I guess. It's usually always very sad but, um, but uh, there are people who have this road that long time and go back into, into work. It's like um, the, I think that Australian monk who just wrote us in a way, um, letter of recommendation And um, if you have, um, have a, had an affair, say for instance, you can't keep that forever because it just kind of tries. you're living a lie and you, it eats you from inside and it's just kind of very painful. And the longer you leave it, the worse it becomes. Thailand um, and Burma. Thailand and Burma, they don't like each other. And so there's wars between um, Thailand and Burma. And uh, it was suspected at that time when, the, when Thailand and Burma were at war that, that the um, Burmese spies were, d were disguising themselves as monks. And so the Thai, probably the Thai king thought, okay, well, in order to discover who the spies are, order all the monks to shave their eyebrows and then once the spies return back to Burma then they can discover who has shaved eye shaven eyebrows and therefore can find out who the spies are. So if you reflect on it, it seems a bit unwholesome that monks should be shaving their eyebrows and all that spies can be found so that they can be assassinated. <laughs> so I guess we, we I, at our monastery we don't shave our eyebrows because I myself think it's a unwholesome thing that has such an unwholesome history that why do we keep on doing it? So, why it's do we? It's a fairly recent thing. Pardon? It was a fairly recent idea. I, I'm not sure how long, but probably a couple of hundred years. <coughs> but because the king is so respected in Thailand, then he think that, mm -hmm. I guess that's the reason why it's just kept mm -hmm. going. Is there certain expectations from your senior monks to where you'll go now? And is that is that set in stone? Is that set? Or is that can that be negotiated? You know, do you have if, do you have um, yearly reviews? <laughs> um, see how you you go and on what you'd like to achieve, and, and that's it. Is that something that you discuss with people? Yeah. This is, this is, I don't know how it works. So. <laughs> Life, life is not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
the life as a monastic is not sure. This is what we um, we we need to realize, you know, instead of because all the idea of expecting or getting somewhere is suffering at the bottom. <laughs> you get something you have been for a while, then it gone. So yeah. <laughs> there is a process though, isn't there, before someone can take ordination that they have to have the agreement of all the monks present at that moment. So you could get rejected before you even get in. Usually, the order of monks and nuns works as a uh, census base. So, if one monk or nun disagrees, then it's all vetoed. Mm. Put nothing works. So, at my ordination, if one monk decided that he didn't want, he did he disagreed for whatever reason, then my ordination wouldn't go ahead. So, uh, if someone wants to ordain, then. Um, um, and yes, it's possible that, that some monks or nuns may say, no, we don't think this person should ordain for certain, certain reasons. Um, given in the Buddhist scriptures, there's certain reasons, certain people who shouldn't ordain. And um, so if you have certain sicknesses, tuberculosis, um, epilepsy, something like that. Um, uh, usually, Usually, once um, the process is, if you, if you want to become a monk or nun, then you come to the monastery and after spending some time there, then um, at Sanju we have um, three, re three requirements. One is a blood test, one, second one, the case report, third one is a side test. So, <coughs> we don't want to make sure that we don't have um, child molesters or um, people with HIV or something join the monastery. Um, it's possible that people with certain illnesses can join the monastery and I certainly have stayed in a monastery where a monk had hep B and it was just, um, <coughs> it was, um, you know, the arrangements were made that it was possible for, for him to, to be able to live with everyone else. Um, <coughs> so usually then you become um, if that goes okay, then you become what we call an anagarika, or also we would call a postulant, <coughs> or one in training. And then you do that for a year after a year, if all goes well, and the, the, the monks or nuns think that um, you've been a good candidate and you haven't, um, <coughs> haven't done too many things wrong. <laughs> well, there's always forgiveness. But <coughs> <coughs> um, after that, then you can become a novice. After a year of novice period, then if everything goes okay, then when you're given coordination, then after coordination, you generally you have to you have to have a teacher for five years. So you have to you don't have to have the same teacher, but you have to be living have to be living under a teacher. And so um, sometimes you do see in traditional Buddhist cultures that. People just kind of have a drive through McDonald's ordination and then they wander around here and there, they don't really have a teacher and no real training. And you can actually see that kind of quality in those people when you meet them, that you can tell what kind of, how their monastic life has been so far by, just by the way they act. Um, but um, according to, to uh, Vinaya standards, you should know both the monks and nuns' uh, rules in, in detail and be able to recite both, both of them in Pali. But uh, not many people these days actually do that. So generally, it's what happens these days. If, if you can look after yourself with regards to basic meditation, 
and you can look after yourself with regards to the to the rules that you know what is and what is not an offence and you can um, you can look after yourself then um, then after five years then you're given independence but um, that's not guaranteed either so if, it, if your teacher thinks that you shouldn't be given independence then they can keep your independence for the rest of your life depends on how good you are and how well you develop but, um, but it's not all concrete either because um, you know, uh, one of the things that Bandar Shadow asked of me if I was to take coordination that I should stay there for two years and that if I did want to leave I'd have to have a very good reason um, so moving around too much is not, not always good it's like Ajahn Chah talks about this um, uh, a mangy dog, wherever it goes, it runs under the tree, it's, gra- it's got mangy, it's scratching itself, it runs in the house, it's got, it's itchy, wherever it runs, it's always itchy. So it doesn't matter where you run, you always run, you've always got the defilements with you, so better to stay put under the same tree for a little while first. <laughs> 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 mm-hmm. yeah. How much um, guidance do you get? And how, I, or I get the impression that once sort of left on their own in their huts and they might get taught once a week. Is there more to it than that at Santi? Actual teaching under the teacher? Well, at Santi we have um, about four, four times we come together a week. We have two sort of classes, uh, a Dhamma talk and a group meditation. Um, in the future we will be having vineyard classes. It's just been a bit um, hectic, but um, generally we read it ourselves and we can um, be quite educated from that. So we can actually learn learn it from the book. Actually, we can learn from other people's experience. And, okay, well, what is this? Is this right or this wrong? And then you can figure, it, you can ask someone to find out. Um, <coughs> with regards to meditation, um, any time you have any questions, then you can can always discuss it with other monks and nuns or you, and you can talk with Bhante Siddhartha and it's one of the, uh, his good qualities is that he's very open, you can talk about things with him and, um, and generally and I've been quite, um, quite happy with the instructions I've got from him for my, for my meditation so there's always that support there. So, we just, we just have to learn to be able to reach out for that support more often. Okay, one more question? Any more questions? Yes, I was, no, you talk about you can't be crazy before you go in, but I've heard recently <laughs> of somebody going crazy while they were in, they're perfectly all right when they went in. <laughs> and now they're in the main institution. <laughs> Yes, I have heard there's a, there's a monk who in Perth who has yeah. who has gone, gone crazy. Yeah. He's a high, I yeah. venerable writer. Right, he, he, was a, he was a great philosopher before yeah. he went in, a very wise man. Yeah. In the, in the uh, monks and nuns rules, there's um, cases where you don't fall into offences, and one of the cases is mad. So if you're mad, you don't, can't break any of your rules. So if mm-hmm. they're crazy, or something and they go around you know, stealing things or whatever it's because they're out of their minds so it's not that it doesn't break any of their rules but um, I mean <coughs> the question is I guess it's a very complex thing and I guess we shouldn't jump to conclusions about it because it's many possibilities one thing so he could have had something there that he thought he could deal with and was trying to find the trying to think that the monastery was the way to solve the problem that the monastery can't solve or many possibilities um, <coughs> it's hard to know so it does seem that it can be that the, the striving in itself that you can't get strive too hard yeah. 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 This, is, this is like with me I, I did my did my knee in and that was because I sat in meditation too long and um, in the end, my my knee went okay. Well, it's enough. I couldn't sit on the floor for about maybe two months, 
had to see the chiropractor for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what happens. Mm-hmm. But I think that's, that is a very big problem in monastic life, especially in, in, um, in male monastic life, is that we think tough is good, mm-hmm. but tough is not good, not all the time. I mean, if you, like in, in Thailand, they have the rule that even if you have malaria, you still have to go an arms round. So that's a bit extreme. It's kind of like going to the extreme where the Buddha said that, it, you know, the, the, the extreme of self notification. If you're sick, you're sick. That's just, you know, just the way it is. Um, I think that um, we, we as Westerners already kind of have that kind of, kind of striving attitude, but I think that the that Asian people more have their emotional kind of maturity, whereas maybe they need to push themselves a bit more, whereas we, we need to learn the emotional maturity and to back off on the pushing. Mm-hmm.